Thank you. You may be seated. I guess they want you to think about each verse as you come to the end and before you finally sing, Amen. <laughs> Let's take our Bibles and turn with me, if you will, to the passage that we read just a few moments ago. We're over in the book of Exodus. We're in chapter 10, looking at the plague of darkness in verses 21 through 29. Now you remember our budak, blood, frogs, lice, flies, rain, boils, hail, locust, darkness, and as the saying goes, coming your way soon, death. Blow fro, lie fly, moo bo, halo, and daddy. Let's try it. I know you're embarrassed to do this every week. It's okay. Someday you will have memorized all ten plagues in order. So let's try it together. Blow, fro, lie, fly, moo, bow, hey, low, daddy. Okay. You're only going to have to hear that a few more weeks. But then I will put a surprise test on you, and who knows what kind of prizes there will be for people who are able to write that down and not peek at their neighbor and pass it to the end of the row. And pastor does weird things every now and then. All right, take your Bibles and turn to Exodus chapter 10. Last week we began to establish a foundation for our study of the plague of darkness. The first thing that we learned, and I hope you remember this because it's very important, it is the foundation for everything that is going on throughout the rest of Scripture in relation to darkness. We're going to be seeing that. The first thing that we learned is the supernatural, tangible darkness was the supernatural presence of the Shekinah glory. In verses 19 and 20 in Exodus 14, just four chapters from now, it tells us that specifically. The angel of God, which went before the camp of Israel, removed and went behind them. Remember, God had been leading them by this cloudy pillar a pillar of cloud by day, a pillar of fire by night. But the cloud is a very dark cloud. We tend to picture it as sort of a light, see-through, puffy white cloud, but that's not the way it's described in Scripture. This pillar of cloud went from before their face and stood behind them. And it came between the camp of the Egyptians and the camp of Israel, and it was a cloud and darkness to them, that is to the Egyptians, but it gave light by night to these, so that the one came not near the other all the night. And we see that same distinction in our text in chapter 10. It's darkness that could be felt by the Egyptians, but there was light all night long in the dwelling of the Israelites. This is not a natural darkness. This is a supernatural darkness. It's tangible. And it demonstrates, as we learned last week, the presence of the Shekinah glory. Secondly, we saw that darkness is often associated with the Shekinah when God is about to judge. I read you several verses in the Psalms. I'll just remind you of four of them. We read quite a few last week. But Psalm 18:9, he bowed the heavens also and came down and darkness was under his feet. This is God coming to judge. Verse 11, he made darkness his secret place. His pavilion round about him were dark waters and thick clouds of the skies. Psalm 97, 2, clouds and darkness are round about him. Righteousness and judgment are the habitation of his throne. When God is being portrayed as a judge, you see fire and darkness. He sent darkness and made it dark. <laughs> and you know what? When he does that, everybody is so scared they don't do anything. Listen to what it says. And they rebelled not against his word. When God manifests himself in the darkness, when God manifests himself with the fire, when God makes his darkness felt, they don't move. That's the Shekinah, the dark side, if you will, of the Shekinah. It's the side of judgment. The third thing that we learned was that the believer who is in fellowship with God does not need to fear what is in the darkness. I did not give you these verses last week. I just sort of mentioned that in passing. But let me give you a couple of passages that give you encouragement on this. If you're in fellowship, 
you do not need to fear what's in the darkness. Now, let me ask you a question. How many of you have ever been afraid of the dark? Oh, come on. I know you all have. Yes. <laughs> At some time in your life, think back when you were a little kid and, you know, you had just read a scary story at school, or maybe your parents had read you one of those scary stories about the thing under the bed, that Dr. Seuss story, which I can't remember the name of, um, you know, and, and so you went into your room and when nobody was looking, you peeked under the bed, <laughs> or you looked into the closet and the lights went out and you lay there and you heard something scratching against the window and it was just a bush, but you had some kind of fear in your heart. Darkness brings fear. God designed it that way for those who are out of fellowship with him. Psalm 91, you all know this psalm. It's a beautiful psalm, but God speaks in it of how you do not have to be afraid of the darkness, the terror that shows up in the night. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress, and my God, in him will I trust. Here's the believer in fellowship. That's verses 1 and 2. Surely he, that is the Lord, all capitals, Jehovah, the one who manifested himself by that name to Israel, they have not yet known me by my name, Jehovah. That's to know him, not just intellectually, but to know him in the most intimate and personal way. I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress. Can anything get through that fortress door? My God, in him will I trust. Surely he shall deliver thee from the snare of the fowler and from the noisome pestilence. He shall cover thee with his feathers and under his wings shalt thou trust. His truth, sanctify them through thy truth, thy word is truth, shall be thy shield and buckler. Now look at verse 5. Thou shalt not be afraid for the terror by night nor for the arrow that flieth by day, nor for the pestilence that walketh in darkness, nor for the destruction that wasteth at noonday. A thousand shall fall at thy side, and ten thousand at thy right hand, but it shall not come nigh thee. But you get to see it, he says so. Only with thine eyes shalt thou behold and see the reward of the wicked. See, the man who's in fellowship, that's verses 1 and 2, does not need to fear the terror by night or for the pestilence that walketh in darkness. You'll see it happen to the wicked. Because thou hast made the Lord, which is my refuge, even the most high thy habitation, there shall no evil befall thee, neither shall any plague come nigh thy dwelling. Interesting. He mentions pestilences and he mentions plagues here. What do you think he is taking you back to? This is David 500 years later or 400 years later. And he talks about the pestilences and he talks about the plague of darkness. What is he reminding them of? He's reminding them of that night, those three nights in Egypt, where there was light in the dwelling of all the Israelites and there was darkness in the camp of the Egyptians. Psalm 104, verse 20. How many of you have ever been camping? Anybody here ever been camping? Most of us have been camping, yeah. We've been camping at one point or another. Not Harold, but camping of some sort. Uh, we've, we've all gone out there and ever been out in the woods? I used to be a Boy Scout. I don't think I'd want to join that organization today. But uh, at one time I was a Boy Scout. We camped out. We did wilderness camping. And you know, sometimes it can be kind of spooky out there in the forest. And all you've got is this little one-man pump tent that you've set up and you hear these funny noises and you hear things walking through the brush and you think is that a, a bear is it a lion a mountain lion what is it out there you hear something rustling and it's like down at the foot of your cotton you think is that a rattlesnake we had rattlesnakes in Texas what is it Ever been there? Psalm 104.20 Thou makest darkness, and it is night, wherein all the beasts of the forest do creep forth. 
Isn't it nice to know that you have a sovereign God? Isn't it nice to know that no matter what's going on around you in society and today in the United States, there are beasts creeping forth because the country is becoming dark. The light of the gospel is being extinguished. Remember the plague of darkness that God gave darkness to the Egyptians, yes. But God gave light to the Israelites. And you can rejoice that God has given you light. Dear people, there are fearsome things out there. And they may come here. But we do not need to be afraid. We need to trust. I think it's appropriate that we have this plague at this time. You know something? Unbelievers love darkness. God says you like darkness? I'll give you darkness. He gave it to the Egyptians. But for the unbelievers who continue to harden their hearts, God says, you love darkness? I'm going to give you darkness for all of eternity. You know John chapter 3. Have you ever thought of it in that context? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Verse 19. And this is the condemnation. Listen to it carefully. Remember, plague of darkness, Egypt. Now see how it's applied in John chapter 3 in the context of John 3.16, which we all know and love. This is the condemnation that light has come into the world and men loved darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For everyone that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light lest his deeds should be reproved. But he that doeth truth cometh to the light, that his deeds may be made manifest, that they are wrought in God. John is taking us back to the plague of darkness. He's telling us that Jesus is light. You remember we've discussed this before. Jesus is Jehovah. Jesus, who is the second person of the Trinity, is the one who always manifests the Father. The scripture is replete with evidence that would indicate that Jesus is the one who spoke to Moses out of the burning bush. Jesus claims that in John chapter 8. Before Abraham was, I am. Those are the words that God spoke to Moses out of the burning bush in Exodus chapter 3 verse 14. Jesus is called the angel, the messenger of the presence the angel of the Lord. He's not a created being. He's the messenger of Jehovah himself. That's the way he's portrayed in our text. They won't come to the light. I'll give them the darkness that I gave to Egypt, says Jesus. They pursue my people. I will stand to defend my people and I will give darkness to those who love darkness and I will give light to my people. Deliverance from darkness is one of the primary illustrations of salvation in the Bible. This is all new material now. Psalm 107.10. Darkness. Deliverance. Salvation. Such as sit in darkness and in the shadow of death, being bound in affliction and iron. He brought them out of darkness and the shadow of death and break their bands in sunder. Up unto the upright there ariseth light in the darkness. He is gracious and full of compassion and righteous. A verse that you all know, it's from, it was used in Handel's Messiah. The people that walked in darkness have seen a great light. They that dwell in the land of the shadow of death, upon them hath the light shined. You see, darkness and death, darkness and death, that's what you see in the plagues in Egypt. There's darkness and then there's death. There's the darkness and then there's death. 
And we find it used as a picture over and over and over through the Old Testament prophets and used as an illustration in the New Testament that Jesus delivers from darkness and death. It's the picture of being saved by being pulled out of Egypt. What pictures God gives to us in the Bible are they're pictures that even a child can understand. Because most of us, in the way that we think, are children. We don't think complex thoughts. And so God gave us lots of simple illustrations to remind us of the truth of who he is and what he has done. Isaiah 29, 18. In that day shall the deaf hear the words of the book, the eyes of the blind shall see out of obscurity and out of darkness. That's a messianic prophecy. It's fulfilled by Jesus. It's quoted in the Gospel of John. Isaiah 42, 7. To open the blind eyes, to bring out the prisoners from the prison, and them that sit in darkness out of the prison house. Darkness is a picture of spiritual bondage. John 12. Excuse me, one more here. Uh, Isaiah 42, 16. And I will bring the blind by the way that they knew not. I will lead them in paths that they have not known. I will make darkness light before them and crooked things straight. These things will I do unto them and forsake, not forsake them. Again, quoted in relationship to our Lord Jesus Christ. And it's sung in Handel's Messiah. Make the rough places plain and make, crook the stra uh, make straight the paths uh, that are crooked. John 8. Then spake Jesus again unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. Life versus death. Light versus darkness. Where does it take you back? It takes you back to the plagues of Egypt. Jesus is preaching to Jews. When he's making these claims, what do you think they're thinking? Exodus chapters 10 through 14. John 12, 35, four chapters later. Then Jesus said unto them, Yet a little while is the light with you. Walk while you have the light, lest darkness come upon you. For he that walketh in darkness knoweth not whither he goeth. Spiritual blindness. Did you notice he didn't say stand in the light? He didn't say stand in the light. He said walk in the light. You see, the light is moving. Do you remember the pillar of cloud and the pillar of fire? It only stood still on occasion and then they would pitch camp. But it wasn't to keep them in the wilderness. It was leading them to the promised land. And if when the pillar got up, and God had told them to follow it, and it began to move, they just said, I'll come back tonight. You know, we'll just sit here. This is, pretty, this is a pretty nice place. Say, Elim is one of the places where they, they camped. There were, there were wells there. And, um, you know, it, it's really miserable out there in the desert. Let the Shekinah wander around out in the desert someplace. God will see that we're not following him, so he'll come back to us. What do you think would have happened? they would have been in darkness. It says, walk in the light. If you are not walking with Jesus day by day, you are not walking in the light. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, speaking of Jesus Christ, who is the one who is in the light? Who is the one who is the resident of the Shekinah? John tells us, if we walk in the light as he is in the light. We have fellowship one with another in the blood of Jesus Christ. His son cleanseth us from all sin. Dear people, those are all pictures that point you back to Exodus. This is an illustration that is used over and over and over and over again in the New Testament. But that means you are living the Christian life. To walk in the light, to walk in the spirit means that you are living for Christ. Not just proclaiming him with your mouth as you sit in one spot and do nothing. It means you are living for Jesus. It means you are taking a stand at work. It means you're taking a stand among your unsaved family members. It means that you are standing up for righteousness when your friends who are still pagans are, are trying to tempt you to do something that you ought not to do. 
You are walking day by day because you are studying the word of God. The entrance of thy words giveth light. Light! How much time do you spend every day in the word of God? Five minutes? You got five minutes of light a day? Sorry about that to all you out there on the internet. That was the internet microphone that just fell on the pulpit. What does it mean to you to walk in the light? The children of Israel walked for how long? Forty years. And because they rebelled ten times during that forty years, God said everybody age twenty and over is not going to get into the land except Joshua and Caleb. The little ones that you thought were going to get eaten up by the inhabitants of the land, they're going to be the ones that take the land. But all of you adults, You've rebelled against me over and over and over and over and over and over and over again ten times. You won't make it. Walk in the light. Walk while you have the light, lest darkness come upon you. For he that walketh in darkness knoweth not whither he goeth. John 12, 46. I am come a light into the world that whosoever believeth on me should not abide in darkness. When you trust in Christ, you don't have to keep living in the dark. You know, some of you, uh, your eyesight is beginning to go. Some of you know people who have gone totally blind. You probably hope that it never happens to you. Can you imagine what it would be like living in the darkness all the time, Some of you, your eyesight is okay for daylight hours, but you don't drive at night because you can't see well enough. Our eyes grow dim as we get older. There are people who are every day, 24 hours a day, walking in darkness. Think how difficult it would be to function to find even simple things, to have to memorize every time you set anything down, where exactly you put it, to learn to count the steps in your home or in your apartment so that you know where everything is located so you don't break your shins as you wander around. Darkness is a picture in scripture of spiritual blindness. It's a picture of sin. It's a picture of spiritual death, like the total non-life, lifelessness before God created life. It takes us back to creation. You know, everything goes back to creation eventually. Genesis 1, 2, And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. Where there's darkness, where there is non-life. Only the Spirit of God can bring life out of the darkness. And when he does, he always brings light. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. And God saw the light that it was good, and God divided the light from the darkness. All the way through Scripture, God divides the light from darkness. Where are you walking? It all goes back to Genesis. Do you believe Genesis? Or do you think it's just sort of a, a fairy tale story? It's sort of an allegorical way of describing theistic evolution. The rest of Scripture is built on this, folks. If you allegorize, if you mythologize Genesis, you have to mythologize everything else in the Bible. Because this is the foundation. We get over to Proverbs chapter 4. The way of the wicked is as darkness. They know not at what they stumble. Or about chapter 20, verse 20. Young people, listen to this carefully. Some of you older people might need to repent on this one. Proverbs 2020. What's 2020 vision? Good vision, right? You can see well. Here's something that will help you see well if you pay attention to it. 
Whoso curseth his father or his mother, his lamp shall be put out in obscure darkness. You say, well, I never said anything bad about my parents. Okay, God reads your thoughts. Young people especially, pay attention to that. God knows the thoughts of your heart. Have you ever cursed your father or your mother in your heart? They told you to do something you didn't want to do. You older folks too. If you did, you need to repent. It may have been the removal of some blessing in your life. And you need to repent. Don't harden your heart. You're hearing a message on this subject. This may be the last opportunity God gives you to do that, to repent from it. Have you ever cursed your father or your mother in your heart? You're really, really mad at them. You might even have whispered a curse word under your breath. Didn't let them hear it, because you knew you'd get smacked up the side of the head if you did. Whoso curseth his father or his mother... His lamp, what does a lamp do? It gives light, doesn't it? His lamp shall be put out in obscure darkness. Isaiah chapter 60, verse 2. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth. As you look around you today, is darkness covering the earth? I think it is. And gross darkness the people. But God has a remedy. This is also out of Handel's Messiah, or it is from Isaiah and into Handel's Messiah. But the Lord shall arise upon thee, and his glory shall be seen upon thee. That's the Shekinah. The Shekinah for the believer dispels the darkness. Jesus talked about it in Luke chapter 11, verses 34 and 35. Here we have this picture of spiritual blindness and spiritual sight. The light of the body is the eye. Where, therefore, when thine eye is single, that is, it's in good health, thy whole body is also full of light. That's the light receptive organ. You, can't, you can feel heat, but you can't see it if you don't have eyes. But when thine eye is evil... Thy body also is full of darkness. Take heed, therefore, that the light which is in thee be not darkness. Taking us back to creation and the plague of darkness. Darkness is a picture of the vanity of life without God. That, by the way, is the theme of the book of Ecclesiastes. People look at Ecclesiastes and say, boy, what a miserable book. That guy was really down in the mouth the day that he wrote that. No, Solomon is showing you in the book of Ecclesiastes, if you follow it through, that if you don't have God, everything that you do is vanity. If there is no God, if there is no eternity, if there is no life after death, if there is no accountability, if there are no rewards, everything is vanity. That's the whole point of the book of Ecclesiastes. And that's the way he ends. He says, you know, let's hear the end of the matter. Fear God and keep his commandments. That's what's going to be profitable to you. When you obey God's word because there is a God, he is in control. Things happen because God is in control and he blesses those who follow him. But let me give you some darkness out of the book of Ecclesiastes. Solomon understands this as he writes. The wise man's eyes are in his head. And by the way, Solomon made it very clear, and David, Solomon's father, made it very clear that to be wise, you have to have the fear of the Lord. If you don't have the fear of the Lord, you are not wise. The wise man's eyes are in his head, but the fool walketh in, fill in the blank, darkness. The fool walketh in darkness. And I myself perceived also that one event happeneth to them all. What happens to everybody? Suppose you lived on a desert island, you wouldn't have to pay taxes. So what's the only other thing there is? Death. Yeah, some wise man has said that, you know, the only two guaranteed things are death and taxes.
One thing happens to them all. Are you ready for it? The plague of darkness precedes what? The plague of the death of the firstborn. Here's for the man who has not God. Ecclesiastes 5. All his days also he eateth in darkness. And he hath much sorrow and wrath with his sickness. Can you imagine eating every meal in total darkness? You're sitting at the table and there's a banquet of food on the table and you don't know where it is and what it is and you don't know what to reach for and you slop your hands around and you're messing everything up and spilling stuff on the floor. All his days he eateth also in darkness. Chapter 6, verse 4. For he cometh in with vanity and departeth in darkness and his name shall be covered with darkness. Talk about a depressing view of life. If you don't have God, that's the way life is. You come in with vanity, you depart in darkness, you don't leave any legacy, your name is covered with darkness. The plague of darkness was designed to teach Pharaoh a lesson. Five chapters later, Ecclesiastes 11, verse 8. But if a man live many years and rejoice in them all, Yet let him remember the days of darkness, for they shall be many. All that cometh is vanity. If there's somebody here today or somebody listening on the Internet that doesn't know Jesus Christ, you're living in vanity and darkness. And when you depart, it will be really dark you'll still be there but it will be really dark and it will also be very hot as we'll see in a moment and nobody will remember you no matter what you've done and how much you've made and how much you've amassed and all the junk of earth the things of earth that you've hoarded and thought so much about Darkness is a picture of judgment during the coming day of the Lord. And we have talked about the day of the Lord, so I'll just read you a few verses on that. It's going to be a day of darkness and of gloominess. This is Joel 2. A day of clouds and of thick darkness. As the morning spread upon the mountains, a great people strong. There hath not ever been the like, neither shall there be any more after them, even unto the years of many generations. Joel 2.31. The sun shall be turned into darkness, the moon into blood, before the great and terrible day of the Lord come. It's a picture of judgment during the day of the Lord. Amos 5.18 Woe unto you that desire the day of the Lord. To what end is it for you? The day of the Lord is darkness and not light. Amos 5.20 Shall not the day of the Lord be darkness and not light, even very dark and no brightness in it? When we get to the book of Revelation, we're going to see that there's some very serious darkness <laughs> in the book of Revelation. And it's going to be accompanied by some very great heat that scorches men. It's giving them a warning of what hell will be like when they step out of this life. Zephaniah 1.15, that day is a day of wrath, a day of trouble and distress, a day of wasteness and desolation, a day of darkness and gloominess, a day of clouds and thick darkness. Are you ready? Do you know Christ? Oh, I beg you. Don't put it off. Don't think, oh, I'm young. I, I, can, I can accept Jesus someday. You may not live to the end of today. Have you trusted Christ? Jesus said, I'm the light of the world. He's the one who by light delivered Israel from the darkness. He'll help you see and protect you from the Egyptians. Acts 2.20 The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before that great and notable day of the Lord come. Our time is up. You're going to have to wait. Not next week. I will not be here next week. Lord willing, Ken Olson will be speaking in the morning. Dan Wade will be speaking in the evening. Tonight, Jim Buer is speaking, our missionary to Chile. But there is some incredible things that we have yet to look at. Some passages of Scripture that you may not have ever considered. And I hope will help you see whether or not you're walking in the light. Or... 
that you have judgmentally been plunged into darkness designed to bring you to repentance before death. Our gracious Heavenly Father, this is serious material we're talking about. And you use the plagues of Egypt over and over and over and over in Scripture and in the New Testament to remind us that indeed you are a God of grace as you are a God of grace to Israel in spite of their rebellious sif nets but you're also a God of judgment on those who harden their hearts. Dear Father, take your word. It is your word that has power, not this preacher. I'm a very weak and feeble vessel, and I don't do a very good job. But your word is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. It pierces thee into the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of our hearts. May your word have free course in us this day. For we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.